Good day to you, this is Lorano from the French National Reference Center for Autoimmune Diseases of Strasbourg in France. I am really happy to share this time with you. Today is the World Lupus Day. We are confined in our homes and it's a great opportunity to talk about the history of systemic lupus, which was one of the most complex medical history I have ever heard of. Our story begins many, many years ago with a man who was very ill. At that time, there was no Belgium, no France, no Germany, but the land disputed between Hez and brothers, and the man lived in the city of Liège. The man's name was Heraclius, and at that time, he was the Bishop of Liège. The city of Liège had been founded around the year 700, and rapidly became very prosperous. Heraclius suffered from his leg and had tried many ancient remedies without any success. Because all the remedies had failed, he decided to go on a pilgrimage to the tomb of Saint Martin in the French city of Tours. And we know this story quite well because it is told in many beautiful books, such as this one, The Life and Miracles of Saint Martin translated from Latin to French. We learn that the man had a disease called the wolf, le loup in French. This is actually the first written mention of the word lupus in the medieval literature. In the same book, we are also told why the disease is called lupus. It is because it eats the flesh. There is therefore no reference whatsoever suggesting a relationship between the rash on the face and carnival masks. This is a very common misconception. The man asked for advice, but nobody could cure him. He was told to confess and pray Saint Martin, which he did for seven days and seven nights, and after that time, his lupus was miraculously cured. He went back to Liège and built the Collégial Saint-Martin, which is a church, in the memory of this miracle. Around the year 1200 was established the famous Italian school of Salerno in Italy. It is one of the most famous medical schools in Europe. Ruggerio da Frugardo had already brought great contributions to medicine, including the reduction of fractures, the surgery of hemorrhoids, and he states in one of his work that lupus arises in the thighs or in the legs, in the inferior limbs. A few years later, Rolando da Parma tells us that noli me tangere, which is known since the beginning of the Middle Age, is only used for lesions on the face, where the term lupula, which is a small lupus, is used when the same lesions are located on the limbs. The medical school of Montpellier in the south of France is also very powerful at that time. In 1305, Bernard de Gordon publishes his major work, Lilium Medicinae, in which it confirms that lupus is the same disease as the erosive lesions which were described by the Greek authors under the name Herpes Histiomenes. In 1530, Paracelsus distinguishes between consolidated lupi and lupus vorax, and I think that last term, lupus vorax, clearly underlines the potential for destruction of the bones and the tissues that is associated with this form of the disease. There is a lot of confusion during the whole Middle Age. In 1535, Menardi tells us that lupus is an ulcer of the lower limbs. The confusion remains very strong. More than 200 years later, Daniel Turner in his book tells us that lupus is a cancer of the lower limbs. The real turn in the history of lupus will arrive in Europe, circa 1750. At that time, London is already a well-developed city. And in the end of the 18th century, in Bloomsbury Square, which still exists, there is an amazing physician, Robert Willen, which many consider to be the founding father of dermatology. 
He publishes the first textbook of dermatology with beautiful hand-painted plates. Together with his uh, student, Thomas Bateman, they bring a major contribution to the history of uh, skin diseases. Just have a look at these wonderful illustrations of varicella and elephantiasis. And their work actually includes the first published drawing of lupus. It is quite interesting to notice that these are very destructive lesions that are not that of lupus in the modern sense. And it is completely amazing that this great confusion between different diseases, tuberculosis, syphilis, will be maintained for at least two more centuries. At that time, lupus is a purely cutaneous disease and it is classified among tubercula. It is considered to be a very destructive disease for which there is no treatment. At that time, another major centre for medical care is Paris. In 1800, just a few years after the French Revolution, Paris is a very well-developed city with its streets packed with vendors of all sorts. And at that time, people with skin diseases or contagious disease were sent far away from the centre of Paris in the Hospice du Nord, uh, which is now the Hôpital Saint-Louis. It was a time where the medical masters, here is Alibert, uh, were uh, giving lessons, teaching to the students by showing the patients in open lectures. In 1835, the French dermatologist Pierre Rayer makes a clear distinction between different types of lupus, lupus accidents that erodes the flesh, lupus non-accidents that remains very superficial, and lupus vorax, which is highly destructive. Piet initially described uh, lupus as eritem centrifuge, eritema centrifugatum, as reported by Cazenave. One of the most uh, extraordinary uh, historical artifact we have is this edition of the Saturday, the 27th of July, 1850, uh, which contains the first mention of the term lupus erythematous by Cazenave. Cazenave further describes the preferential involvement of the face, of photosensitivity, cicatricial evolution, and that there are some differences with tuberculous lupus. He also makes the first clear distinction between lupus and cancer. Apart from London and Paris, a very significant contribution to the history of lupus is coming from the Viennese School of Dermatology around 1845. At that time, Vienna already has very lively streets and beautiful palaces. And of course, the Medical University of Vienna, which is one of the oldest medical schools in the world, with its uh, general hospital, which had opened in 1784. In this uh, premises worked von Hebra, who initially reports lupus as Siberia congestiva, suggesting an occlusion of Siberic glands. In 1846, he describes the butterfly rash for the first time, using Schmetterling, the German term for a butterfly. Eventually, he agrees with the, the concept of lupus erythematosus, which is proposed by Cazenave, only he uses the Latin term lupus erythematosus instead of the French term lupus erythematous. This is also a time uh, at which the distinction from Rosa Sear is uh, clearly made. In 1863, the Viennese dermatologist Neumann publishes the first pathology of lupus skin, and he actually shows most of the, the findings we still find today, cellular infiltration, uh, bacillopathy, peripillar period nexual involvement. This is amazingly modern. Kaposi reports the first description of discoid lupus, and he makes a distinction between two forms of lupus, discoid lupus and disseminated lupus, which at that time does not mean systemic, but means disseminated cutaneous involvement. Capuzzi makes the first description of polyarthritis in lupus patients. He also reports the presence of constitutional symptoms, and unfortunately that some patients 
may actually die from lupus. In 1876, During from Philadelphia writes the first American textbook of dermatology containing incredible illustrations, as you can see. In 1880, Hutchinson reports that the lesions on the face may look like bat wings, hence the term Vespertilio, which is a type of bat. He publishes an illustrated book containing several fascinating drawings of lupus patients, including cases with annular lesions, which will later be termed subacute lupus by Gilliam and Sondheimer. In 1894, Payne uses quinine to treat lupus patients with some success. In 1898, Radcliffe Crocker proposes the use of salicylates instead of quinine to treat lupus. At that time, in many cases, the lesions are actually burnt using cauterization. You can see the catalogue drapier from Paris, 1924, uh, from which you can buy some metal things that will be heated and burn the lesions. Then in 1900, something which is completely incredible for us today, uh, dedicated nurses use magnifying glasses to concentrate sun rays on the skin of lupus patients to burn the lesions. And in 1906, the patients benefit or maybe do not benefit from the application of the uh, Nobel Prize uh, received by Finson, which is the Finson lamp, uh, which is a lamp that concentrates UV light on the skin. Uh, it was mostly used to treat um, lupus vulgaris, but there are some reports, um, quite unsuccessful, I must say, on uh, cutaneous lupus. In his Atlas of Dermatology, the Parisian uh, dermatologist Alopo presents very spectacular plates of lupus vulgaris and chronic lupus erythematosus. In 1902, Sequira and Balian report the first case series of lupus patients and they notice the, the marked female predominance. And they also report for the first time the high frequency of serocytes and also that renal involvement can be observed in some patients with lupus. At that time, the relationship between lupus and tuberculosis remains very, very unclear. They also published the first photograph of lupus patients. In 1904, uh, Yodasson uh, compiles most of the existing literature on uh, lupus in, in a work called Lupus erythematodes based on the Greek root for erythematosus, which means red. With the beginning of the 20th century, we are clearly entering a world of modern technology. Just have a look at this wonderfully compact EKG. And this new century is also the century of radioactivity with uh, many daily products, creams, lotions, water whatsoever, containing radium because it was very fancy at that time. And as you can guess, a lupus patients will be treated by the local application of radium salt without any uh, significant success. A major contribution to the history of lupus comes by Osler, who further recognizes the truly systemic nature of the disease. In 1924, um, Emmanuel Lipman and Benjamin Sachs report a novel form of endocarditis, which I am sure you know uh, what it is. And in 1924, in the French medical dictionary La Rousse, which you can still buy nowadays, um, you can read that lupus erythematosus is considered to be related to tuberculosis, of which it is an attenuated form. So we will actually have to wait until 1933. This is the work of Harry Keel. He performs a several ne necropsy and finds that there is no strong association between uh, lupus and tuberculosis. In 1945, well, this is the war and some soldiers are sent to the front and it is also the first report of drug-induced lupus. In 1948, uh, Hargraves described the LE cells, which has disappeared from the uh, classification criteria for quite some time. But this is still occasionally reported by experienced pathologists and it allows us 
even nowadays, to make a very elegant diagnosis of SLE. In 1949, Hasrick shows that the plasma from lupus patients can actually induce LE cells, and in 1954, Misha demonstrates that this lupus factor are actually anti-nuclear antibodies. One of the biggest contribution in the history of uh, lupus uh, comes by uh, Seligman, who reports in, in 1957 that the actual target of these autoantibodies is DNA. In 1958, these properties are used by Friou, uh, who invents the detection of anti-nuclear antibodies using indirect immunofluorescence. And I am sure you are aware that this is still the technique we are using uh, nowadays to detect anti-nuclear antibodies in most centers. In 1961, Anderson reports the presence of anti-ENA antibodies, and this is still very important for the diagnosis of SLE. And in 1966, Tan reports for the first time the presence of anti-SM antibodies based on the name of a patient, which was uh, Smith. This is then the Second World War. The soldiers are sent in many tropical places and they are recommended to take anti-malarials. The anti-malarial uh, that is used at that time is atabrine, which is also known as mepocrine or quinacrine. And this is an important element in the history of lupus because a few soldiers that will actually be sent to these tropical areas have lupus and they will therefore be treated by anti-malarials. And in 1951, uh, Page uh, reports that some soldiers have actually improved uh, their lupus uh, with these treatments. In 1950, Hench receives the Nobel Prize uh, for uh, the discovery of uh, steroids and uh, their efficacy in various inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis in 1948. In 1954, uh, Dubois demonstrates the efficacy of uh, mustard agents such as cyclophosphamide in systemic lupus, and this is really a major advance in the history of lupus, especially in case of severe involvement such as renal involvement. In 1956, Lewis shows the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine in patients with uh, lupus, and the second half of the 20th century is actually marked by the discovery of many drugs that are still in use nowadays. And the rest is both uh, history and our common future. I also would like to acknowledge many of the online resources I have used to prepare this talk, uh, which is based on more than 200 hours of searches in historical archive, and also these amazing references uh, that really gives a very interesting description of the history of systemic lupus. Thank you very much.